So hi everyone, I'm Erdem Week from Stanford and I'm going to talk about the data efficient active learning method for learning reward functions. And this is a joint work with Dorso Sari. Learning humans' preferences can be quite challenging in robotics. We represent the preferences as reward functions. And if we could get demonstrations of how we want robots to operate, just like uh, in this picture, we could use uh, imitation learning to directly learn the policies, or we could use inverse reinforcement learning to learn the reward functions. But acquiring such demonstrations are sometimes very challenging due to a few reasons. So first of all, it's hard to demonstrate trajectories to robots with more than a few degrees of freedom. And also, people do not always perform the tasks the way they want robots to operate. For example, there is a study by Anka's group uh, where they show uh, people do not want autonomous cars to drive as aggressively as them. So in that sense, driving trajectories are not even informative of humans' preferences. So as in many other works, we are going to use pairwise comparisons as opposed to demonstrations to learn human preferences. A simple comparison can be between fetch picking different objects. For example, it can grasp the red cup or it can grasp the blue cup. And the human's response will tell us about the human's preference on the color of the cup. Or the comparisons can be much more complex. For example, we can compare two different driver, uh, driving trajectories to learn the human's uh, driving style. To mathematically analyze this, we model the environment as a dynamical system. So given the initial states x0a and x0b, and the control inputs ua and ub, we can simply generate trajectories psi i and psi b. And we then ask user which trajectory she prefers. As in many other reward learning works, we are assuming there are some well-engineered features and the hidden reward function is a linear combination of those features. So what human is trying to do is basically trying to maximize this hidden reward function. And thanks to the linearity of the reward function, we can, uh, we can use the difference in the future vectors to compute the difference in the reward values. And we call this difference vector psi. So each query is really asking whether uh, w dot psi is positive or negative. This means we can use the sine function to represent human's response. Let me give you an example. Let's say w lies in a uh, three-dimensional space. So we only care about the sine of w dot psi. This means we can scale w with any positive constant. And this also means we can assume w lies in the unit ball. And without any prior information, each w sample is equally likely. So we can sample from this uniform unit ball using Metropolis, uh, Metropolis Markov chain methods. And each query corresponds to a separating hyperplane in this space. For example, if the user chooses trajectory b, then this psi represents this choice, and the preferred side of the hyperplane is the right-hand side. But humans' responses can be noisy. And we are following the previous work here, and we are assuming this update function to model the human noise. The cool thing about this update function is it's log concave, so it enables us to sample efficiently from the distribution on weights. So after we got the response from the human, we are changing the weights of the uh, weight samples. For example, in this case, the left side of the hyperplane was uh, non-preferred, so we are decreasing the uh, probabilities there by the update function. And this implies psi uh, determines how informative the query is. For example, if we have the second query where all the most probable weights are on the same side of the hyperplane, then this query is not really informative because we almost really know what human will select, like which side of the uh, hyperplane he will select. But some other hyperplane can be much more informative by almost equally dividing the uh, volume of weights into two pieces. And this means the size with the queries we select matters. And we can formulate this as an optimization problem to find the optimal query. So what we are trying to do is to maximize the minimum expected volume removal. That is the volume that's going to be removed after the human's response. And because there are two possible outcomes, the human either chooses trajectory A or trajectory B, uh, we are going to take the minimum of the, those and we are trying to maximize this quantity. And there are of course dynamics constraints. Each trajectory should satisfy the dynamics. But there's a problem with this approach. Humans' responses have to come in sequentially. This means we cannot parallelize this algorithm. And even the bigger problem is, 
even though we are minimizing the number of queries, each query generation takes too much time. Because if the algorithm tries to optimize for each and every step, just like just Grandmaster Anand did here, then it will take too much time. And the person we are interacting with would just fall asleep. <laughs> so more technically, we need to solve the optimization, and we need to perform sampling for each and every query. And it, ta it takes too much time. This is obviously undesirable. So our solution is to generate batches of queries instead of single queries. So how do we do this? To do that, we are slightly modifying our optimization. We still want to maximize the minimum expected volume removal, but it's, it's now the volume that will be removed after a batch of queries, not a single one. So if the batch size is B, there will be two to the B possible outcomes. So the minimum will be taken over two to the B uh, different terms. And there are still dynamics constraints, of course. And to be able to select multiple queries, we are discretizing the space of trajectories. So going back to our W space, we previously had this very informative query, the yellow hyperplane. And we make an important observation here. If we introduce another hyperplane that's only slightly different, it's still very informative. But the problem is, when the human responds to one of them, the other one is almost completely redundant. And this means, this tells us something very important. If we choose the most individually uh, informative queries, then the batch will be far from being optimal. In fact, it can be hardly better than a single query. And this is actually what people do in greedy selection. This is widely adopted, and it's unfortunately suboptimal. So let's say these 16 points represent the most individually informative hyperplanes, just like in the previous slide. So in greedy selection, the assumption is each query is selected independently. So for example, if the batch size is 5, we basically take the five most individually informative uh, hyperplanes. And because they are very similar, there will be a lot of redundant information. So we need to increase the dissimilarity between the hyperplanes. And if we think, about, if we think on the optimization, we can note that this is similar to, like what we are trying to do is we are trying to maximize the information gain from the whole batch. And in that sense, it's similar to joint entropy maximization problem. But well, this problem requires an intractable exhaustive search. So can we approximate the solution? One heuristic to approximate is to maximize the average pairwise distance between the uh, hyperplanes. In this way, we can get a more diversified uh, batch. And this is exactly the maximum diversification problem. But even this approximation is NP-hard. So now I would like to discuss three different algorithms to achieve both an informative and a diverse uh, batch. So, uh, and they will all outperform, significantly outperform greedy algorithm. So we want to increase the diversity between batch queries, but we don't want to generate uninformative queries at the same time. So we, again, select 16 most individually informative queries greedily, and then we are applying our algorithms to increase the dissimilarity between them. So what we are doing here is we are applying k Meadows clustering to cluster the this pre-selected set into five uh, clusters, and we are taking Meadows as the batch elements. We cannot use k-means here because we need samples to be from the set. And in the k-means, we wouldn't know if the uh, selected point satisfies dynamic constraints or not. But here, if you look at the right top corner, you can note that we could select the sample in the corner, and in this way, we could increase the average pairwise distance. This means we can still improve this algorithm. So we propose a better version where we only focus on the boundary points. So what we are doing is we take the convex hull of the points, and we eliminate the interior part. And then we are applying our Meadows selection algorithm. In this way, we are increasing the average pairwise, uh, average pairwise distance between the uh, selected queries. But the problem is we are completely ignoring the interior space. So there is a huge information loss there. So we finally come up with our successful elimination algorithm. This algorithm is based on an important observation about the difference between maximum diversification problem and our problem. In maximum diversification problem, each sample is equally important. The only aim is to maximize the average pairwise distance. In our problem, we have expected volume removals for each uh, queries, and they represent how much we want those samples to be in our batch. 
So what we are doing is, we again start with this pre-selected set, and we choose the closest pair, and we eliminate the one with the lowest expected volume removal. And we keep doing this until we end up with five different uh, queries. In this way, we are achieving both an informative and uh, diverse set. And we also have some theoretical guarantees for this algorithm. So successful elimination always keeps the most informative query in the batch, because that query will never be eliminated. And thanks to this, if we ignore the errors from discretization, sampling, and human noise, this algorithm will always converge. We applied our methods on a simple linear dynamical system. And we used alignment metric, uh, which basically quantifies the alignment between the true reward function and the learned reward function weights. Uh, and we have seen, like, uh, as you can see from the graph, number active method is an upper bound for our algorithm. This is expected because it optimizes for each and every step. And the other baseline is the random uh, querying. As you can see, successful elimination performs better than random querying. And in fact, it also performs better than other batch mode active methods. We also tried our algorithms on a bunch of different tasks from OpenAI Gym, from Mujoko, and on a driving simulator. I'll show you two of them. So here is a visual from the driving simulator. So when we did the same analysis with the simple linear dynamical system, uh, we have seen a very similar result. This is expected. But when we plot the alignment which is with respect to time, we have seen that non-batch active method is performing poorly because it needs too much time to generate queries. In fact, you can see from this table that uh, batch mode active learning methods reduces query generation time significantly. We also did the same uh, analysis with the tosser task. This task is from Mujoko, and the aim is to throw the ball into the green, or either into the green basket or the red basket, and the choice depends on the human's preference. So we have seen something very interesting when we plotted the alignment with respect to the number of queries. What we have seen is, Non-batch active method was performing highly suboptimally, even with number of queries. This is because it tries to solve a non-convex continuous optimization, and it can get stuck in local optima. Our algorithms do not suffer from this thanks to the discretization of the trajectory space. And we also plotted alignment with respect to time, and as expected, our algorithms were much faster. In fact, the time difference between uh, query gener like time, dif time required for query generation was uh, even less in this case, the difference was even more. So you might wonder what's the trade-off between the batch size and query generation time. As you can see in this plot, smaller, uh, batch, smaller batches yield to faster convergence with the number of queries, but they also require higher query generation times. This means one can select a specific batch size to have a convergence rate with respect to the number of queries, and it can still be a reasonable query generation, uh, query generation time. And we did some user studies to uh, assess the applicability of our algorithm. We recruited 10 users, and we asked them 150 pairwise comparisons on driver and tosser tasks. I will show the results of the driver task now. Here, uh, you can see one of the features. This is namely collision avoidance feature. It's being close to minus one means uh, people really care about avoiding collisions. It was interesting to see that two of the users took a more risk-taking approach. And this experiment showed us that we can use our framework to learn different human preferences. And here, I'm visualizing the trajectories that were optimized uh, with the reward functions learned uh, after some number of queries. As you can see in the uh, first video, after, like, without any prior information, the car is basically taking random walk when the robot is controlling the steering. But after 30 queries, it learns the heading preference, so it learns how to go straight. And after 70 queries, it learns how to drive. And I want to emphasize that there are no demonstrations involved here. We learn driving just by using 70 simple pairwise comparisons. <laughs> and we did the same analysis on the tosser task. As you can see, without any prior information, the robot doesn't know what to do, so it doesn't even throw the ball. Yeah. After 10 queries, it learns throwing the ball. And the good thing about this uh, environment is that there are two baskets. They represent different uh, preferences. So after 40 queries, it learns uh, throwing it far away because the human prefers the green basket. And after 100, it successfully throws the ball into the basket. 
So our key idea is to use pairwise comparisons to learn humans' preferences by generating batches of queries. In this way, we reduce query generation time and enable par uh, parallel data collection. In this work, we, uh, in this work, we just did, like, we just learned uh, preferences of individuals. But in fact, we could use, uh, we could learn single reward function from a population by simply parallelizing our algorithm. And something we are currently considering is to learn multiple different reward functions from a population, which we can model as a mixture model. For that, we are thinking of using different query types. For example, we can use full rankings instead of pairwise comparisons. And this is something we are currently considering. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much.